This episode is brought to you by Steelroot, a national leader in helping companies meet cybersecurity compliance requirements and prepare for CMMC. Their experienced team of engineers and consultants assist organizations of all sizes to implement and manage IT systems that meet the technical requirements in DFARS and CMMC. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana Mantilla, and I will be your host today. And our guest is Corey Munson of PCmatic. And Corey, welcome. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the company you work with? Sure. Hi, Dana. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Corey Munson. I am Vice President of Sales at PCmatic. If uh, any of your viewers have ever heard of PCmatic, it's probably because we've for about 20 plus years, advertised our antivirus product on national TV, uh, largely to a consumer audience. What your viewers may not know is the fastest growing segment of our business is working with small and medium sized organizations, uh, state and local governments, schools, even on up to the federal government on endpoint protection. And it's protection all built around a patented application allow listing technology that we've built. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of people have definitely seen the commercial and that's where they have first heard of PCmatic. So yep. it's very nice you're sharing with us all the extra stuff that you guys do and that you guys are involved with CMMC. So I didn't know that before I started talking to you. Absolutely. I think it's going to be important for everybody eventually, right? Mm -hmm. And so today we're going to talk about some of the challenges with cybersecurity. All right. So our first question is going to be, what are the biggest challenges that we're facing today? Or what is the biggest? I'm going to say at, at risk of sounding cliche, let's talk about ransomware. I mean, you, you can't open a newspaper if people still read newspapers or open your favorite news site or Twitter feed without seeing a, another case. And, you know, I think a lot of what's driving it right now is it's it's become a viable business model. When I'm out there talking to the public about ransomware and, and trying to educate, I, I really try to explain this is this is something that is highly profitable. And as long as it continues to be profitable, it'll be around. You, you don't need to be a computer genius to get your hands out, out there in the dark web, get your hands on a $5 ransomware kit that'll generate hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue potentially. Um, unfortunately, it is. It's a viable business model and about 60% of the people are paying ransom. So. Yeah, and that's exactly, if no one ever paid the ransom, then we wouldn't have a problem. But obviously, we have, as we have seen, even with some of the very big ones that are and on TV, and we're all watching and saying, seeing that they paid the ransom, so. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, all right, so is it realistic to lead to think that all cybersecurity attacks can be prevented? I'm going to say it's it's naive for anyone to say all can be prevented. I think there's always going to be one-off cases. But uh, a good friend of mine, Scott Augenbaum, who wrote a book called The Secret, uh, the Secret of Cybersecurity, he's a retired FBI agent. He spent 30 years investigating cyber crimes. And as part of his book, one of his first couple of chapters, he maintains that about 90% of what he saw could actually be prevented. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's, there are some basics that we, we tend to overlook that could be put in place that would take us a long way into preventing a lot of this. And unfortunately, the, the cybersecurity industry has kind of shifted more towards the, how do, you, how do you react? How do you respond to the attack versus how you prevent it? And I think the seriousness of the ransomware problem has forced us back to thinking about how do we prevent it in the first place and what aren't we doing that, that could potentially be done. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of basics that, uh, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are doing nothing proactive about uh, trying to avoid any kind of an attack or even doing any kind of training with their people. So the bar is very low, which also helps with the ransomware attackers. So, Unfortunately, yes. Yes. So are we overthinking the problem of the basics, cybersecurity basics? That's the matter. I think we, I think we really are. Uh, you know, if you take a look at uh, all the different cybersecurity technology out there and the millions or if not billions of dollars that are potentially being invested into machine learning and artificial intelligence and solutions built around that, which I think are incredibly important and they, they definitely have a place. But if we go back to the fact that we are frequently we see that we're overlooking preventative steps that could have been taken that are much more cost effective, that are much less labor intensive than some of these higher end solutions. 
yeah, I, I think we definitely are overthinking the problem in many cases. And even some of these bigger cases, colonial, I mean, you name it. If you read into the fine print of what actually happened, a lot of cases it ties back to bad passwords or accounts that were disabled. This isn't rocket science in many cases. Yeah, I think that, and I think that even just starting with the basic employee onboarding, right, as well as an employee offboarding, because just like you said, some accounts don't get deactivated, and then maybe that's a way that somebody's getting in, or maybe they sell off the the login access to that information, the disgruntled employee that left, or you know whatever the case may be. But um, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of basic stuff that we could definitely be doing that we all need to start talking about, and then putting a little bit of a roadmap together. Because I think, and I hear this all the time from business owners, I don't know where to start. I don't even know what I should the first thing I should do is. So I think when, you know, some of the um, MSP, um, the managed service security providers come in and they say, oh, don't worry, we'll take care of everything. That's what everybody wants to hear. Oh, good. It's your, this is going to be your mess. It doesn't need to be my mess. And we really can't just assume that the IT department is going to take care of everything. So. Well, and until, until we've all developed this cyber mindset mm -hmm. and, and realize that extends far beyond the IT department, this has been a challenge ongoing, right? It's going to be seen as an organization wide, wide issue. It, it, here's the, the quote I'll throw out there. If, if you haven't seen the John Oliver segment about ransomware yet, he, he tied it all together. If you, if you watch him on HBO, he said in a world where most people's doors are unlocked, just locking your door might be a deterrent. I think that's kind of where we're at right now. There's a lot of unlocked doors and it mm -hmm. could be as simple as locking those doors or maybe adding a deadbolt or two. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the conversation gets very overwhelming very quickly. So if an IT person is talking to a non-technical business owner and they start throwing out some terminology that they're not, now they're not understanding now they, they don't. So they just throw it all all out because they can't understand it gets too complicated as opposed to saying hey let's just talk about this this employee over here okay there's their computer what kind of login do they have and walking through the basic things because they know that employee they know their computer they can say oh that's right we use this software application and they do log in with that and i think they're the only one that uses that to log in meanwhile half the department's using the same login uh for that for whatever they're getting into so you can't track anything so basic conversations are a good way to start all this i at least think which which is our look our next our next question is the uh <laughs> what mm -hmm. are the public basics yeah the, the ones we always remind our community of um i'll just kind of tick them off here and we talked about training i mean it, again that's low-hanging fruit but the the uh, number of employers that actually take the initiative to make sure their employees are, are trained in cybersecurity, and we can talk later on about about the impact on work from home it's stunning how little that's that's actually happening multi-factor authentication i mean people are starting to preach it more and more but again a simple step that if you haven't implemented it with your bank account already you will have to soon so why not across the board um the new Department of Defense's cybersecurity program, CMMC, can be very confusing and overwhelming. A3 is a cloud-based collaborative environment for an organization seeking certification. A3 builds CMMC packages and has access to a marketplace of consultants, RPOs, and assessor C3PAOs. A3 creates a roadmap for each cybersecurity requirement and helps break things down step by step. Please visit cyberdataintelligence.com forward slash A3. If you, backups, we know how important backups are, but how many people are testing their backups? Mm -hmm. So when it's time to rely on them, they're actually accessible. Mm -hmm. Regular updates, we know a lot of this stuff is coming through software that hasn't been patched in, in years, months, days, whatever it may be. And then something that we're really focused on that is actually recommended by CISA, it's actually required as part of levels four and five of CMMC is application allow listing. Simply locking your endpoints down and not allowing anything to execute unless you know it to be good. It seems pretty simple, but none of the typical traditional uh, security software operates that way. So, so taking those basic steps right there would take you much further down the road than many organizations are right now. Mm -hmm. No, that, that, that's a that's a very good point. And I just skipped over one that we I wanted to touch base it is antivirus. Some people say, "Oh, I have antivirus on my computer." Is that enough? I'm going to contend no. It does it does it have a, a place? Absolutely. Do you need it? You absolutely need it. Unfortunately, most of the antivirus technology was developed back in the '80s, and it was built around this idea that we're going to track all the known viruses out there. We're going to push that list of definitions out to all the endpoints that are being protected by that software. And 
if there's something that new comes along, push out new updates. Well, we now know that malware evolves, what, every 30 seconds or so? It's no longer practical to approach it that way. That's why we've kind of flipped it on its head by saying application allow listing is the way to do this. You just simply lock everything down. This is this goes to zero trust, right? Which is a huge umbrella term. I get it. But this is a fundamental part of zero trust is you lock your endpoints down and don't allow anything to execute unless you know it to be good. So to answer the question, is it enough? No, it's definitely the layered approach that we've been preaching for years. Everyone in the industry has been. But there are some layers that are better and more accessible and economical than others. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Very well said. Okay. So we just talked about the basics. And then now... <laughs> The big uh, shift working from home has created quite a little cybersecurity challenge. And I think also because it happened so quickly, we we're all just thrown out there. So it was either, OK, well, since we're not sure how secure we are, we're just going to stop working and not make any money or we can kind of wing it and then try to put some security measures in. So why don't we talk about some of those challenges? Yeah, I, I had a friend who happens to be a, a CEO of a MSSP uh, regionally here in the Midwest, and he put it to me this way. He said, you know, back in March of what was it, 2020, he said, up until that point, we were protecting all these organizations with the castle doctrine, right? You take the crown jewels, you build up your walls around the crown jewels, put your soldiers and, and the military on the wall and you protect. He said, what happened in March almost overnight was everybody showed up with their kid's laptop at the office one day, loaded the crown jewels onto that laptop and went home to work for the next two years. Mm -hmm. We actually did some research internally where we surveyed, uh, launched a pretty broad survey of work from home employees and it was alarming. We actually did it in the spring of 2020 and did it again this past spring and tried to evaluate that security posture of your typical work from home employee. It was shocking how bad it was to begin with. And even more shocking that a year later, none of these issues that we had seen before, none of these red flags had been addressed um, and still aren't addressed to, to this day. So if this is going to be long term, we really need to sit down and come to terms with what the risk really is working from home. But, you know, our survey data said somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of work from home employees were still using their own personal devices. Mm -hmm. So that's red flag number one, because those are, are minimally secured at best. Most are connecting through a really poorly configured home Wi-Fi network that. You know, if you're like my neighborhood, you walk in your neighbor's house and they've got the chalkboard with the Wi-Fi yeah. password written on it. And then the majority of people we surveyed said they were getting zero, almost zero additional cybersecurity training from their employee about how to work from home more securely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just a recipe to, for disaster. And our survey data said that in a year's time, nothing had really changed. Employees hadn't made any significant improvements in those areas. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's a huge concern because I think we all know it's gonna be long-term in one form or another, mm -hmm. and we have to address what that means from a cybersecurity standpoint. Yeah, well, when we first got, got sent home, you could even buy a laptop. There weren't really any available. All of a sudden, the demand just went poop, so they were all gone. So you are using your junior's little laptop to right. working and work. And then we do have to come up with some kind of long-term solution because I think the world has changed as far as the quote-unquote office going to work. And you know, now that we can all communicate via Zoom or you know whatever we call this teleconferencing, and you can work one place and live a completely different place that normally you wouldn't be able to do that. And the commercial rent that these buildings, these owners were paying for this stuff if they don't have to do that. However, those you know things being changed. The, the security manner absolutely needs to be changed. And we could have a very easy online course to teach people that this is what you need to be doing with your computer. And and it could be kind of very, like, look at this here on your computer, look at this here. You know, I did um, a talk earlier today about changing the password on your router. And a lot of people say, oh, just change the password on your router. And I agree with that, but people don't know how to do that. So I basically told them just, whatever the make and the model is, go to Google or go to YouTube and type in that and say, how do I change the password on, on this router? And I guarantee a video is gonna come up that's gonna help walk you through or contact your service provider and just say to them, you know, I wanna change some of these passwords in here. How do I go about doing this? And they'll, they'll do that too. It's finding the time to do it, number one, and then actually committing to wanting to learn how to do it. So the easier we can make it, the more likely it will get done. 
to your point, as part of that that survey we did, we actually asked people. You know, a lot of during that f- initial mass migration to work from home, seemed it seemed like everyone was publishing the checklist of here's what you need to do to work more securely at home. And one of those things was you know update your router password, all all the things that you should be doing. We actually asked the question of these things that are found on the typical checklist. How many things are you comfortable going and doing on your own right now? And we were finding maybe 30, 40 percent of these people were. Mm-hmm. So you again would assume that 60%, maybe more in some cases, aren't even doing the, the simple things like updating a router password because they have no idea. It was the same password that when the cable guy installed it 20 right. years ago, right? right? So um, <laughs> it, it, that's something that needs to be addressed. And I think yeah. employers really have to start to evaluate what part of that do they own? Uh, what part of your employee handbook now carves out what the employee's responsibility is for creating a secure work environment from home and what role does the employer p- play in maybe auditing that on a, on a regular basis. There's there's some fine lines and some policy that needs to be ironed out there, but it's it's something that has to be for done for the better for the long term. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think when they when they were at work, you could say, okay, we know this is your device you're using, this right. is you're connecting, so we control that. But now that they're in their home, that's when it does get a little sensitive with with you know dictating or you know right. some requirements. So, but it is a conversation that that we need to have. There's no question about that. Right. Oh, anyway, well, this was a lot of really good information. Is there anything else you want to share with everybody before uh, we go? I don't think so. You know what? I'm a big LinkedIn guy. So if any of your viewers want to engage on LinkedIn, I think that's how you and I connected, Dana. Yeah. It's uh, Corey, C-O-R-E-Y dash Munson, M-U-N-S-O-N. And then to learn more about my company, it's PCmatic.com. And you can learn more about our consumer product or our professional products. And as long as the world keeps spinning, my team's going to be out there on the road at, at a lot of the conferences that are now live and in person, or at least some of them that are still live and in person. So if, uh, if you're out there, we'd really like to engage and, and have a bigger, broader conversation about security. Yes, definitely. And if you, either me, me or Corey, if you want to connect on LinkedIn, please feel free to reach out and send a connection request. Be happy to connect. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time. And Corey, thank you very much for your time. And we will see you all around on the next episode. So take care. This episode is brought to you by Steelroot, a national leader in helping companies meet cybersecurity compliance requirements and prepare for CMMC. Their experienced team of engineers and consultants assist organizations of all sizes to implement and manage IT systems that meet the technical requirements in DFARS and CMMC. Thank you.